everybody, episode 811 of the podcast in Streaming America, the Air Tour Sports Podcast. It is Thursday, December 21st, 2023. People, I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody is ready for a jam-packed Thursday episode of the Air and Torres pod. It is loaded. This is what you need to know about today's show. We're going to open National Signing Day. It was crazy. Chaotic on Wednesday. Everything you missed, everything you need to know from Florida completely falling apart. Uh, Florida State not doing well. Miami doing very well. Auburn, Alabama. What the heck happened to Colorado with Jordan Seaton, by the way? We have so much to discuss. Then from there, we'll take a quick break. We'll do a little college hoops. Where? North Carolina played Oklahoma. UConn opened Big East play. Uh, you know, you go on and on down the list. Just a busy couple days. Memphis took care of business against Virginia. So we got ourselves a jam-packed show. Lot to discuss. By the way, quick reminder. Friday, we will have a little bit of a bonus episode. Hour-long conversation with the Hall of Famer Jim Calhoun. He is a legend. He is an icon. Uh, and we talk about all sorts of good stuff. This 2024 UConn team Last year's national championship team, uh, recruiting Kemba Walker, recruiting Ray Allen, recruiting Kevin Durant and Kevin Garnett. We'll talk about all of it. Even if you're not a UConn fan, you will enjoy. Uh, Monday, which is Christmas Day, there will be no episode. Tuesday, I'll come back. I'll make my official college football playoff picks and other bowl games. And then the rest of next week, we ramp up into the new year. Cannot believe we are on the back half of December so it is a busy time. Uh, but with that said, we can talk about the end of December and the beginning of January when it comes. Because right now, we got a loaded Thursday show and there is no more time to waste. So let's get to the topic of the day. Topic of the day was National Signing Day in college football. Did the magical day, all these kids, all this time, sign their national letters of intent. Some of them committed years ago. Many of them committed in the summer. Will they stay committed? Will they not stay committed? Who knows? But I bring it up because I want to go through all the all of the big storylines from National Signing Day. There is so much to dive into. And let me start by saying this. The single biggest story of National Signing Day, and really even the lead up to National Signing Day, it was the Florida Gators. There is no way to put it, but Florida has had a disastrous, disastrous about last probably six to eight weeks in the lead up to National Signing Day. National Signing Day got worse. They lost a few more marquee players. They easily could have lost a few more. And I'm just here to tell you, it might be a take, it might be hyperbolic, but I think Billy Napier is truly trending as one of the worst hires in modern college football history so let's get into it. Let's talk about what happened on National Signing Day because here's the thing about Billy Napier. Hasn't been good on the field. There's been embarrassment off the field. This 2024 recruiting class was supposed to be the sign that, hey, this guy knows what he's doing. He's got a plan. The problem was it crumbled like a Christmas cookie here over the last couple of weeks, okay? So the real story of Florida's National Signing Day, it didn't start on National Signing Day. It really started about five or six weeks ago when the class just started to fall apart. So this class reached, I believe, as high as number three in the fall during the football season. It might have even reached number two at various points, but really number three was kind of the high point. But it was really about five, six weeks ago when the losses on the field started that the cracks in the foundation of this recruiting class started as well. About three, four weeks ago, four to five star, depending on what recruiting service you look at. Defensive lineman named Jamonte Waller decommits from Florida, had been committed in the summer. He flips to Auburn. You have a four-star cornerback named Wardell Mack flips from Florida to Texas. You have, oh, by the way, a four-star offensive lineman, Nasir Johnson, flips from Florida to Georgia. You also have on top of that in recent days, and this was a big one, Xavier Filsimi a guy that many believe to be maybe the best safety in high school football. He had been trending to flip to Texas for a while. He has family in Texas. He has family in Florida. He's been committed to Florida. He flips to Florida. So even before National Signing Day, in the lead up, four elite prospects all flip. 
Well, National Signing Day comes, and it gets worse. Four-star defensive lineman Amaris Williams from North Carolina had been committed to, to, to Florida for a while. He flips to Auburn. So if you're keeping score at home, that's two for Auburn, two for Florida, or two for two for Auburn, two for Texas, and one for Georgia. And then to just pour salt in the wound, a four-star linebacker, Adarius Hayes, flips to Miami. And so in total, you had six marquee recruits in about the last six weeks that were committed to Florida that did not sign with Florida. Here is the crazy part. Florida's top two prospects on National Signing Day took forever to get their paperwork in. DJ Lagway, the quarterback that this entire class was built around, he's from Texas. I might have talked about him on the show. When Mike Elko got hired, there was buzz that he was at least meeting with Texas A&M. I was told that Florida held that one off. Then uh, a day before National Signing Day, Lincoln Riley reaches out. Lincoln Riley had previously recruited him. So that kid, it takes forever to get his paperwork in as he's talking to Texas A&M and USC. And then LJ McCray, many believe to be the best defensive lineman in high school football, said at the beginning of National Signing Day, I'm not signing a letter of intent after being committed to Florida. He does eventually sign with Florida. Let me just say this. If Billy Napier had lost DJ Lagway and LJ McCray, it wouldn't have happened, but I actually think it would have been a fireable offense um, right here, right now, because again, there's nothing positive going on on the field. And the recruiting class was the one thing that kind of sold you, okay, maybe this will get figured out in the long term. So if you lost those two, I think it would have been a fireable offense right away, but they got those two, but it doesn't change the fact that, listen, I'll be blunt. I don't know if I've ever seen a recruiting class fall apart like this over a five, six week period. This was a class that was rated as high as number three in the country about five, six weeks ago, it finished at number 15. Number 15 in the country. By the way, there was another four-star, somebody that that flipped to Texas A&M. Now, there was mixed reports whether, whether Florida really wanted them, whatever. Maybe there was some stuff behind the scenes. But this is a debacle, and it leads to what I said a minute ago. This Billy Napier hire is trending as one of the worst hires I ever remember, okay? And some people would say, oh, it's early. He needs time, whatever. I'm just going to give you the facts on Billy Napier, okay? So Billy Napier, admittedly, he took over a bad situation from Dan Mullen, but he hasn't really done anything right. First of all, year one goes six and seven. They were really bad. And you say, well, it's Dan Mullen. It's this, it's that. You can blame him, blah, 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 this and that. This year they go five and seven. So in total, when you include Dan Mullen's final season where they went six and seven, and then this past season where they went, or they last year they went six and seven. This year they go five and seven. That is the first time since the 1940s, since the 1940s, that any team at Florida has lost, has had three straight losing seasons, okay? Listen, I get, even if Dan Mullen left a mess, Florida should never have back-to-back losing, never have three straight losing seasons, let alone back-to-back losing seasons under a first and second year head coach in the port. Florida should never be this bad, period. This is my belief. There is no reason for Florida to be this bad, but especially in the transfer portal era, when it's never been easier to acquire talent, Florida should never be this bad. Beyond that, it's not just that they're bad. It's that some of the losses are embarrassing. Arkansas doesn't win an SEC game except in the swamp. A week before they play Florida, they fire the offensive coordinator. Offense looks great. You sit there and say, well, maybe things are moving. No, the next week they go to Auburn and get destroyed. Lose to LSU when Jaden Daniels sets records with 606 yards of total offense. Ray Davis, 280 yards rushing for Kentucky. These are Madden numbers, and they get put up on the regular under Billy Napier. And so I'm just here to say, like, I don't root against the guy, but I am just here to say, like, I I don't know what else there is to say. Six and seven in year one, five and seven in year two, in an era where it's never been easier to bring in players. By the way, don't forget last year, and this is an important part too. Anyone else remember the Jaden Rashada debacle? Remember that kid? He was committed to Florida. We find out later he signs this insane NIL deal. It was like $13 over the course of his four years in college. Then he goes to move in, and either the, 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 the collective says, we're not paying you, or we need to renegotiate the contract. So you're losing on the field. 
your most high profile quarterback in your, or your most high profile player in your first class, it's a debacle. And then this year you get as high as number three and it completely falls apart. This falls on Billy Napier, man. And what's crazy about Billy Napier for people who don't know the background, this is a guy that came in as people said, he's one of the most organized, most disciplined, you know, he's got a plan for a plan for a plan. It seems like chaos at Florida. And you can sit there and say, well, it's a new world, NIL, portal, this, that. I don't know. Miami's got to figure it out. Alabama's got to figure it out. In one year, Hugh Freeze got it figured out. We're going to talk about him in a minute. Um, you know, Dan Lanning, it took a year and a half for him to figure it. didn't take a year and a half. He figured it out right away. But a year and a half, he's got a top five, top six class in the country. Sark figured it out. So don't tell me it's NIL. Don't tell me it's the portal, but this is a guy that was supposed to be organized, supposed to be the opposite of Dan Mullen, supposed to take recruiting seriously. And all it has been is one embarrassment after another. And so when I look at this whole situation, I see no reason to think it's going to get better. Now, again, if you lo- if you had lost DJ Lagway on Wednesday, the quarterback, then there's real talk of like, you should probably just be fired because the whole reason to bring him back for year three after two embarrassing seasons was this recruiting class headlined by a five-star quarterback. He keeps DJ Lagway, he keeps LJ McCray, but he lost seven high-profile players in the last five to six weeks. And oh, by the way, it ain't going to get any easier because, did you see that schedule? We talked about it last week with the SEC schedule release. Uh, You got Miami to open, you got Central Florida in the out-of-conference, you got at Florida State, and then oh, by the way, you got the normal SEC schedule, which includes at Tennessee, LSU at home, Georgia on a neutral. You add Texas next year. You add Ole Miss next year. I don't root against anybody, but this is really bad, and I don't see it getting any better. So the biggest loser by far on National Signing Day, Billy Napier, I don't think it's going to get any better. I have a feeling on the Aaron Torres Pod and Aaron Torres Pod YouTube channel, most of next November is going to be spent on Florida football coaching candidates. Prove me wrong, Billy Napier. Prove me wrong. Let's get to some of the other winners and losers from National Signing Day. Okay, so losers, I guess we got to start with the losers first because in addition to Florida, I think you could argue the single biggest loser outside of Florida was probably their cross-state rivals, the Florida State Seminoles. Now, it wasn't debacle, stage five, you know, code red, sound the alarms, but it was a tough day for Florida State. They lost two different five-star players. The first one, a defensive back named K.J. Bolden. Very interesting recruitment. In the summer, it seemed to come down to Florida State, Georgia, and Auburn. A lot of people thought it was going to be Georgia. He commits to Florida State. Then, uh, over the last couple weeks, as we're getting closer to signing day, he's taking visits. He took visits to both Auburn and Georgia. We later found out, by the way, Hugh Freeze did a press conference where he didn't name him by name, but he said we had another five-star on campus that told us he was coming. So it sounded like KJ Bolden was ready to flip from Florida state. He does on Wednesday, but it ends up being Georgia. His commitment was kind of important because it did solidify Georgia as the number one recruiting class in the country this year. The kid is from Georgia, by the way, it's not like it's like this big shocker that he ended up committing to Georgia, but it's a tough loss for Florida state. They also lost a kid named Armando Blunt, a very interesting story commits to Miami, then decommits and commits to Florida State, announces he's reclassifying, which means he's moving up a year to play college football next year. Then on National Signing Day, announces that he is going to flip back to Miami. So I just bring it up because Florida State loses two five stars on National Signing Day. They fall. They were about number three or four in the recruiting rankings. About, you know, coming into the day, they were, I think, number four. They finish on the fringe of the top 10. It's still a deep class. It's still a good class. But those were two difference makers that you did not want to lose, and they do. And I'll just say this. I like Mike Norvell. I think he's actually very good. And I know that I think Florida State fans are happy with him. But obviously, you know, it's it's a a tough situation. Obviously, you're still kind of on the, the precipice of everything that happened involving the college football playoff. And now... You lose two five stars on National Signing Day. Remember, it was two years ago. He lost Travis Hunter to uh, Coach Prime and Jackson State. So not a great couple years on National Signing Day for uh, for Mike Norvell. Listen, this is, you know, you swim with the big fish. You know, you're going to get bit sometimes. And this is exactly what happened there. 
Um, and so Mike Norvell in Florida State is a big loser. I would say USC was a loser as well. And we talked about them on Wednesday's show with all the portal kids and what's going on and da-da-da-da-da and this and that. I just bring it up because of the fact that um, when I look at USC, they lost also on National Signing Day. In addition to losing all those kids to the portal, they lost one of their best players uh, in their class to Oregon, a kid by the name of Ryan Pelham. Uh, an elite wide receiver out of Los Angeles, out of the Los Angeles area, uh, was one of their highest ranked commitments. And he decides on National Signing Day that he is going to instead end up going to Oregon. So listen, I, I piled on Lincoln Riley the other day. I'm not going to keep doing it. But, you know, this was a guy that was supposed to be the recruiting whiz, the offensive whiz, all of that. The recruiting has not been good at USC. And I, could, as somebody who lives in LA, let me tell you, um, whether it's Clay Helton, Steve Sarkeesian, Lane Kiffin, recruiting has never, ever been an issue at USC, keeping those SoCal kids home. Well, you go ahead and look at those recruiting rankings in SoCal right now. It ain't good. It ain't good. USC finishes with the number 18 recruiting class in the country. But why I bring it up, number one player in the state commits to Oregon. Number two is a quarterback, Julian Sand. He goes to Alabama. Number three, an offensive tackle goes to Texas. A defensive back goes to Alabama. A uh, a linebacker goes to Notre Dame. These are players that USC just used to get. And don't tell me it's the NIL era. Don't tell me it's this, it's that. USC used to get those guys. They don't anymore. Um, Lincoln Riley's got to shore some things up. Now, I think Winning on the field is going to help things, and I I don't think they're quite as rock bottom as a lot of other people do, but USC's got to win. Uh, another loser who I may, well, I'll tell you what, I'll save them for the end. Let's get to some winners. First of all, Dan Lanning's a monster, and I said this a few weeks ago, and the, the quote actually got traction. Uh, shout out to the Second Take Twitter account who put out my uh, tweet, or put out my quote here, but Dan Lanning is a monster, okay? And I've said this many times, but um, I know some people who cover Oregon and they said as great as Mario Cristobal was, and we'll talk about Miami in a minute, that going from Cristobal to Dan Lanning is like, it's unbelievable. He said, they said, we've never seen anything like Dan Lanning. Remember, this is a guy in the portal that has already gotten a starting quarterback for next year, a backup quarterback for next year, uh, a couple really good players out of the portal. But I bring it up because on national signing day, successful day for Oregon, they already had like the number five, six, seven class in the country. They flipped the Ryan Pelham kid I just told you about. They also flipped a four-star wide receiver, Jeremiah McClellan from Ohio State. So big day for Oregon. And big day, by the way, for Oregon's former coach at my, now at Miami, Mario Cristobal. Listen, Mario Cristobal on game day, there's conversation to be had about him. But in recruiting, he is a monster. Remember, they improved from five and seven last year to seven and five this year. And this, this cycle, they did great work. You know Miami, like, very quietly finished with the number four recruiting class in the country. Top four classes are Georgia, not a surprise. Bama, number two, not a surprise. Miami at number three edges Ohio State. Now, Miami also took 27 players. But for Miami to have the number three recruiting ranking, borderline insane. They flipped the Armando Blunt kid that I just mentioned from Florida State. Earlier in the cycle, they flipped a kid from Ohio State named Justin Scott. So credit to Mario Cristobal for getting the job done. The number four class in the overall rank, the number three class in the composite rank. Really quickly, there is one other winner that I got to talk about. He is a friend of the Aaron Torres pot. He is Hugh Freeze at Auburn, baby. You know Hugh Freeze in Auburn finished with the number seven recruiting class in the country. And I'm going to read you their top players in that class. Top players, Cam Coleman, five-star, flipped from Texas A&M to Auburn. Now, part of that was the coaching change, but whatever. Perry Thompson, five-star wide receiver, flipped from Alabama to Auburn. Amaris Williams, the defensive lineman I just mentioned, flipped from Florida to Auburn. Demarcus Riddick, a linebacker, flipped from Georgia to Auburn. And then the kid I just mentioned, Jamonte Waller, flipped from Florida to Auburn. So five of their, their top five recruits, one flip from Alabama, one flip from AM, one flip from Georgia, two flip from Florida. This guy ain't flipping kids from uh, Eastern Illinois here. So listen, the Hugh Freeze thing cracks me up because Hugh Freeze, there was so much criticism when he got hired. And I said, what, what are we, why are we overthinking this? 
Now, look, if you could have gotten Lane Kiffin, you had to consider it. But Hugh Freeze won a lot of games at Ole Miss at a time when nobody was winning at Ole Miss, okay? I know Lane Kiffin's doing it now. Nobody was doing it. He took over a 1-11 team. I think they were bowl eligible year one. Um, and by the way, a guy with a track record of beating Saban, almost beat Saban this year, but people didn't want him. Well, guess what? He just signed the number seven class in the country. They're killing it in the portal. Uh, elite players left and right. All the kids signed. There was no drama on national signing. You know, we got drama at freaking, you know, uh, Florida and and Florida State. And this, and Hugh Freeze just got his stuff signed, sealed, and delivered. So credit to Hugh Freeze. Signs a top 10 class. And they're, bit, they're in on some big portal kids as well. So keep an eye on that. Speaking of the portal, by the way, one quick thing. And I do want to wrap this segment because it's going long here. Um, uh, the portal. Got to give credit where it's due. Mark Stoops, the Kentucky head coach, he did that big rant about you guys want a better product on the field fans contribute to NIL. Wasn't a big fan of that approach, but it has clearly worked. Kentucky closes a nice recruiting class, but they got Jamon Dumas Johnson, maybe the best player in the portal from Georgia. He committed on national signing day and Kentucky has probably one of the two or three best portal classes in all of college football. So you got to give him credit. He, I got to own that I was wrong on Mark Stoops because I didn't love that pep talk that he gave, but it clearly worked. It's working in the portal. Two quick last things before we get out of here. You know, a and is a very interesting scenario. So a and has the coaching change. I, I didn't think you should fire Jimbo Fisher, but if you were going to, I did like the Mike Elko hire. Well, we've seen a lot of kids go in the portal. Uh, the latest being Evan Stewart, the former five-star, uh, who has played the last two years at AM. But why I bring it up, Jimbo Fisher, when he got fired, had a top 10 recruiting class. A lot of kids decommitted, a couple decommitted even before he got fired. Uh, Draylon Miller, who ended up at Colorado, being one of them. But on National Signing Day, I thought this was important. The three highest rated Texas AM kids did not sign with Texas AM. Doesn't mean they're not going there. They didn't sign anywhere. But I think that's worth noting. Terry Bussey who is a local kid, um, you know, he did not commit. He did not sign anywhere. Uh, I think he'll end up at AM because he comes from a small town. Uh, you know, he's unfortunately, I believe his mother passed away not that long ago. I think he's going to stay local, but didn't get that signature. Dominic McKinley, four-star, five-star, depending on where you look, defensive lineman, loved Texas A&M. Did not sign. Now he's going to visit LSU. You got to be worried if you're A&M. And then Dalen Evans, another defensive lineman, I believe. I think he's actually an offensive lineman. Whatever. We'll just call him a lineman. Um, he uh, did not sign as well. And uh, he is now uh, planning on visiting. Uh, he is planning on visiting Texas. I think I said he's a D lineman. He is a D lineman. So shout out to AT. You know, the a and fans, I think it's kind of a combination of really – you know, trying to be understanding that this is what happens with coaching changes, but I do think there is a little concern. So we certainly had a little bit of news, but for the most part, the day pretty much went to plan with the major exception of Jordan Seaton, the number one offensive tackle in all of high school football. As I just mentioned, the last time we saw Jordan Seaton, he had a final four of Oregon, Ohio State, Bama, and Tennessee. He gets set to commit. Nobody knows quite where he's going to go. And he ends up on national TV with Skip Bayless and Michael Irvin and Keyshawn Johnson. He ends up committing to Colorado. And it was the shocker of all shockers. It was a stunner. I don't want to say none of us could believe it. I know that I couldn't. I can't speak for anybody else. But I bring it up because it happened. It was a great moment. Jordan Seaton does that statement where he says, if you're a dog, you want to come to Colorado, all of that. Uh, and I bring it up because that was, at that point, seemed like the recruitment was largely done. What was interesting, though, this is the part that I find interesting, was that even after the commitment, all the guys and girls who cover recruiting, they basically said, look, it ain't over until he signs pen to paper. And usually when a kid commits, like, it's just kind of a foregone conclusion, like he's going to end up signing with that school. But you constantly heard these rumors that this kid might take more visits, that he might consider other schools, that he might do this, that he might do that. But why this is shocking to me is for two very specific reasons. One, he actually hasn't taken any visits since Colorado. 
This was a big piece of news last weekend, the final weekend in which you could take visits. Jordan Seaton stayed at home. Now, there was talk about maybe Mike Loxley coming into the home, doing this, doing that. But it's shocking because in a weekend where he could have taken more visits, he decides not to. And then beyond that, and I think this is important, nobody had Maryland on anybody's radar for this kid. Now, obviously, for people who follow the recruitment, it goes without saying that he is from Maryland, uh, began his high school football career in Maryland. He then went to IMG. But Mike Loxley is a guy that has had a relationship with this kid for about four or five years, dating back to when he was in eighth, ninth grade. And let's be blunt. Part of the reason Mike Loxley was brought in for the Maryland job specifically was because he is not only an elite recruiter, but he is an elite recruiter, especially in the Maryland DMV area. So it's shocking because he didn't take any visits that we know of. And then beyond that, that it's Maryland that they weren't on anybody's radar. But it's also not shocking because he has a relationship with this coach. And so the big question now becomes, as I record here, about 5.30 Eastern time here on Wednesday, I'm just looking at the clock just to make sure. Is this actually going to happen? I don't think it is quite as done as I think a lot of people maybe do, but it certainly ain't trending right for Coach Prime right now in Colorado. Now, why I don't necessarily think it's done. There's a big thing going on social media right now that there has been a crystal ball put in for Jordan Seaton for Maryland. That is factually correct. But the last that I saw as I get set to record here, that crystal ball is not from um, it's not from Steve Wiltfong. It's not from any national recruiting insider. It is from a guy who covers Maryland for 24-7 sports. Now, that's no disrespect to this guy. I'm not saying he's not very good at his job, but that could work one of two ways. On the one hand, you know, he could have sources inside the building that have that have information that nobody else on the outside has. But on the opposite side, he could also have sources that are maybe too close to the situation that are getting a little bit ahead of themselves. And so because of it, the fact that I've only seen one person say that it's officially done. Now, everybody's been reporting on it for like 24 hours. This could happen. But the idea that it's done has only been reported by a Maryland team site. And so I'm not totally sold. I'm sure behind the scenes, Coach Prime is working his magic. I'm sure behind the scenes, Mike Loxley is working his magic. I'll be blunt. I don't ever tell a kid what's right or wrong, what they should or shouldn't do. This one doesn't really make sense to me. I know he's a hometown kid. I'm sure NIL is prominently involved. But at the same time, you know, listen, what was the argument for not going to Colorado? For You know, the, the, the Alabama and Ohio State and Oregon fans, what did they say? Well, you're not going to go ahead and win there, blah, 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 blah. And it remains to be seen how good Colorado is. I think they're going to be pretty good. But what I do think, I think there's a better chance of Colorado being actually pretty good next year as opposed to Maryland in the Big Ten with Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, plus Oregon, USC, UCLA, and Washington coming. And so if the argument is don't go to Colorado because you're not going to win and you're going to end up in the portal, one that I don't necessarily agree with, I don't really know that Maryland is that strong of an option as well. I would also say I've seen some people say, well, you know, he needs he wants to be closer to home. I get that. If it's about family, if it's about being close to whatever, that's fine. On the flip side, though, what I would also say is this, is that it's not as though this kid hasn't been away from home for the last two years. He's been at IMG Academy in Florida. So this is a kid that has been used to being on his own. And it's not as though, you know, he, he, he he's never left home before. He already did it two years ago. So this is going to be fascinating to follow. Obviously, if it happens for Maryland, it will be a huge recruiting win. I think the big question becomes what happens if it happens for Colorado and does it become a huge recruiting loss for them? What I would say to that is it's not good, right? I'm not going to sit here and pretend and lie and say, oh, you know, no, nothing to worry about. No, I mean, when you can bring in a five-star, doesn't matter if you're Florida State, Alabama, Georgia, you don't want to ever lose a five-star. You don't ever want to lose a five-star at a position of need. And so, no, it's not good. It wasn't good when K.J. Bolden, the five-star safety, flipped from Florida State to Georgia. That hurt Florida State. Wasn't good when Florida lost a few guys out of their recruiting class on Wednesday as well. You never want to lose talented players, especially on National Signing Day. What I would also say, though, is if you're anti-Colorado, couldn't I make the same argument that you made when he committed? Couldn't I make the same argument if he ends up decommitting? That argument is pretty straightforward. It is... If your argument when he committed was, well, it's only one player, 
How good he how much impact can he really make? Well, couldn't I say the opposite? If you argued a month ago and he committed three weeks ago, whatever it was, that oh, you know, well, I mean, he's just one player. They need help here, 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 and here. If that was your argument, that's cool. I'm not gonna fight you. But wouldn't that also be the argument about losing him? He's really talented. You don't want to lose him, especially when you lost another transfer. Uh, Matthew Bedford, who was committed uh, to Colorado, ended up flipping to Oregon. So I'm not sitting here saying it's great. But I I can't sit here and say that it's the worst thing in the world because people told me it wasn't the best thing in the world when it happened. So we will see what happens. There's This is obviously an evolving story. Nothing is official yet. As I record here, nothing has come out from either side, either confirming 100% that he's leaving uh, the commitment from Colorado to go to Maryland. But at the same time, there's nothing confirming that he is definitively going to Maryland as well. This is something we will absolutely monitor going into the next couple days and just as things go on. All right, everybody. I am back. Good to be back. Good to be back. Final segment of the show. So good to be back. And I do want to go ahead and wrap with a little bit of college hoops because what I'll say is pretty straightforward, right? So I, I, I do think that that obviously, look, National Signing Day has taken center stage over the last day or two. Um, I don't want to say it sucked the oxygen out of the college sports landscape because uh, sucking the oxygen is a negative connotation, like it's not fun. National Signing Day is fun, maybe for pretty much everybody except for Florida fans. But I just bring it up solely to say that National Signing Day uh, you know, was the focus of things. But there has been a lot of really good college hoops on Tuesday night and certainly on Wednesday, and I want to go ahead and recap basically all of it. Now, I'll be blunt. It's about 1130 Eastern time on Wednesday as I'm recording. Alabama and Arizona just tipped off about 10 minutes ago. I'm sorry. It's December. I ain't staying up until 1130 Pacific, 230 Eastern talking college hoops. Uh, not in December, anyway. We get to February and March as a different conversation. But I bring it up because I'm going to talk about most everything that has happened over the last couple of days And I want to start in a very unique place that I just did not think that I was going to be starting on this show, at least from the college basketball perspective. It comes on Tuesday night when the UCLA Bruins, the mighty UCLA Bruins, the John Wooden, Lou Alcindor, Bill Walton, Ed O'Bannon, Baron Davis, you name them, they hosted the Cal State Northridge Matadors. That is a game for people who do not are not familiar with the Cal State school systems. That's a game that UCLA schedules to get that automatic W and get a victory to go into the Christmas break. I bring it up because this past week it was anything but as Cal State Northridge goes to mighty Pauley Pavilion and beats UCLA 76 to 72. And this was very noteworthy for two very specific reasons. One, it's because Cal State freaking Northridge beat UCLA. But two, did you see what Mick Cronin said after the game? So we're going to discuss it. By the way, if you're if you see me on YouTube, I, I I am looking at the TV here periodically just to see what's going on in this Arizona Alabama game. But let's focus on Arizona's current Pac-12 rival. I don't know if you can call them a rival after what happened on Tuesday night, but it is the UCLA Bruins. And and, and first of all, listen, let me say this. If you're not familiar with the geography of, of California, Northridge is a commuter school. Listen, it's a nice campus. I've been there. I don't want to be disrespectful. I have friends who graduated from there, but this is not the game that UCLA should ever lose ever under pretty much any circumstances. Um, for the UConn fans listening, it's the equivalent of scheduling central Connecticut for the Kentucky fans listening, it's the equivalent of scheduling Eastern Kentucky or Pikeville or something like that. But Cal State Northridge gets the win. UCLA falls to 5-5. Five and five. UCLA is not very good this year. So how about this? UCLA started 3-0. and They go to the Maui Invitational. They lose to Marquette. They beat Chaminade. Then they lose to Gonzaga. They come home, beat UC Irvine. Then they lose to Villanova. And then they lose to Ohio State at the CBS Sports Classic. So, and then they lose this game. So they are five and five overall, two and five in their last seven games, including a win over Shamanad, which isn't even a D one opponent. And so it's not good. 
Remember, UCLA lost a bunch of talent off last year's team. They had a bunch of veterans that were recruited by Steve Alford, retained by Mick Cronin. Well, now they're young, they're inexperienced, but after the game, I'm beating around the bush. I'm talking for too long. We need to get to what Mick Cronin said after the game because did you see this quote? It drove me absolutely crazy. Here is what Mick Cronin said after the game. Now, he said a lot of things, and I don't want to paint it as this is the only thing that he said. But this was the noteworthy thing that he said. He was asked about his team's struggles. Here is what Mick Cronin, the head coach of UCLA basketball, said. He said, we did what we could do. Now, you know, let me even, you know, I want to pull up this tweet. I want to make sure that the context here matters. Ben Bolch, who covers the UCLA Bruins uh, for the LA Times. Let me see if I can find this exact quote so I get this right. Um, okay, this is Ben Bolch. This is his tweet. He said, I asked Mick Cronin if a loss like this makes him question roster construction. And he said, alluding to NIL challenges. We did what we could do. Is your question, did we try to get older transfers? Absolutely. So did the Reds, but the Dodgers got them. So basically what Mick Cronin is insinuating is that UCLA's NIL is not good enough. They got outbid for players. And basically this is his Mark Stoops Demand for more NIL money after a bad loss. Let me say this. I just said it last segment. I criticized Mark Stoops when he whined about NIL. And I am going to criticize Mick Cronin here. I am already, listen, we're 18 months. We're like two years into the NIL era. I am already tired of coaches after a bad loss whining about NIL. Get over it, Matt. First of all, I like McCrone. He's been good to me in the times that I've interacted with him. I like his staff. But that is the whiniest, lamest excuse ever after a bad loss that I have ever heard. I'm sorry, McCronin. No excuses. It's like the old line from Wedding Crashers. No excuses. Play like a champion. That is not a good look from UCLA. So, so as far as the statement, a couple things stand out. One, you can't complain about NIL. When you lose to Cal State Northridge, you just can't, okay? I'm sorry. Again, that would be the equivalent of UConn losing to Central Connecticut and Mick Cron or, or Dan Hurley saying, well, you know, I mean, it was our NIL. That's why we lost. Like, no one in Connecticut wants to hear that, and no one at UCLA wants to hear that after Northridge. If you played, and I'm just going to use a hypothetical example, a Duke, a North Carolina, a Kansas, a UConn, a Arizona, and you lose, then I'm sort of sympathetic to the NIL thing. Like, even Mark Stoops. I was critical of Mark Stoops, but Mark Stoops, at least, it was after the Georgia game. Like, Georgia clearly had superior players, and at least Mark Stoops was trying to say, if you want to be on that level, we got to get our NIL right. Well, you want to get on the level of Northridge, there's no excuse. Beyond that, it's not like UCLA has nobody. Now, listen. Only Mick Cronin, and this is the one thing I'll say. I always try to be fair, and I always try to be transparent on this show. I can't sit here and lie and say that I ha I am privy to every conversation in NIL that UCLA had with any transfer at any point over the course of the offseason. But a couple things stand out. One, even if UCLA's NIL is bad, and I have heard it's not good. Like, like I live in LA. I can tell you, by the way, I think this is part of what Lincoln Riley is struggling with with USC football. People in LA, it's just, they're not spending $250,000 on an 18-year-old kid that nobody knows anything about. Maybe they'll take care of guys once they get to campus. Maybe they'll take care of guys once they've proven themselves. But UCLA is not the kind of place where somebody's just going to write a check because a coach says, we need this guy. So I am sympathetic to that from the Mick Cronin perspective. But one, it's Cal State Northridge. And two, the other thing is, look at your roster. It's not like you don't have talent, okay? And by the way, whenever you say this NIL stuff, it's the same with what I said about Mark Stoops. I criticized Mark Stoops because I said you're insulting the guys in your locker room, and it's the same with Mick Cronin. One, let's go ahead and look. The freshman on his roster, just from the... High school ranks. Let's not even include. Um, let's not even include. Uh, let's not even include the international players, which we'll get into in a minute. Okay, 
But UCLA, let's look at their roster right now. So first of all, Sebastian Mack, who's a really good player. Um, now, he did get hurt in the game against Ohio State on Saturday. Uh, this was a game where Sebastian Mack uh, did play and still score 27 points. Sebastian Mack was the number 66 ranked player in America. Brandon Williams, who's very good. I know his high school people, 70th ranked player in America. Devin Williams, 81st ranked. So they got three of the top 100 players in high school basketball. But here's the crazy part. Do you remember who they got in the offseason? UCLA added three or four international players, including two or three who are projected first-round NBA draft picks. They got Adai Mara from Spain, who some people believe is a projected lottery pick. They convinced him to give up professional options in Europe to play in the United States. So you can't tell me, like, like, NIL aside, you mean to tell me this kid just came for the UCLA education and there was zero money that changed hands? I don't believe it. I know he's an international player, whatever. Burka, the kid from Turkey, I'm not even going to try to say his last name, a projected first-round pick, the Athletic, ESPN. You mean to tell me he came over to UCLA for no money? So I'm I'm blabbing. I'm already like 10 minutes into the segment. We got to get some other games. But like it blew my mind that Mick Cronin tried to use NIL as an excuse. It was a bad look. I didn't like it. I thought it was lame. And I just don't want to hear it. Like, like, like I said, we are now uh two years into the NIL era. And I am already tired of coaches every time something goes wrong. Well, guys, if you don't want to lose these games, uh, you know, pay the collective. And it's like, yeah, take care of your players. I'm not saying don't take care of your players because that's the name of the game. But in this era, come on, guys, be better than that. Just be better than that. All right, let's get to some of the results on the court outside of UCLA and Cal State Northridge. Who knew that was coming? Uh, let's start on Wednesday night. Most interesting result to me. So, and again, we're recording here during the Alabama-Arizona game. Arizona is actually down a little bit early to Alabama. Um, most interesting result to me, I would say, well, really two results out of the Big East. The first one, Seton Hall took UConn to the woodshed. Final score, 75-60. to 60. UConn came into this game. They had played only out-of-conference games. They were 10-1. and one. Their only loss was by four points at Fog Allen Fieldhouse, and their 10 wins were all by double digits, including over North Carolina, Gonzaga, Indiana, and Texas. And so UConn has dominated out of conference play. And then they get to league play, and they get destroyed in their opener. A couple things stand out. One, there's no other way to sugarcoat it. It was a bad effort from UConn. Dan Hurley said so after the game. I'm not speaking out of school here. He basically said, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, I am embarrassed at how ill-prepared my team was. And the one thing about UConn, generally they play pretty hard. This was not that game, though. They out-rebounded Seton Hall by one, even though they had have a distinct size advantage. This was a game where they shot four of 21 from three. That is not going to get the job done. They had 17 turnovers. Not going to get the job done. Um and, and, and it's just, you know, what's kind of wild is it continues a trend. You kind of struggled in Big East play. Remember, last year they started 14-0. and Obviously, 11 of those games were in non-conference play. But UConn went 13-7 and in the Big East. And then they lost in the Big East quarterfinals, or semifinals, excuse me, to Marquette. And I just bring it up to say, like, UConn won a national championship last year? but they finished fourth in the Big East. They were not great in Big East play. And so I'm not going to sit here and overreact. I'm not going to sit here and say Dan Hurley is anything other than a great coach. I'm not going to sit here and say that UConn is anything other than a national title contender because I really believe it. But it was just a shocking result. The big thing for me, I keep going back to, I keep saying it. Alex Caravan, who's a, a starter from last year's national championship team. I think everybody just expected him to make the leap. He has not been great in big games, okay? 11 points against Gonzaga the other night, 33% shooting from three. Nine points against Seton Hall, 16% shooting from three. Was not very good at Kansas either. Not blaming him solely. What I am saying, though, he's a veteran. He was a starter on a national championship team. 
He has not looked good early. UConn has to get right, and they need to get him right. The good news for UConn, and I've said it a few times, they have not yet played their best game this season, and I still think that's pretty scary because they basically haven't had everybody healthy at the exact same time, but UConn takes a very strange loss. Seton Hall, 7-4 and four coming in. It's not like they were playing at an elite level. They had lost every Power 5 game that they had played in the non-con. Bad loss for UConn. One loss that I wouldn't say is bad, but certainly a little bit surprising. Creighton losing at home to Villanova. First of all, Villanova, give them credit. They were down double figures in the second half. We've talked about Villanova. Really talented portal group, um, but they struggled in the out-of-conference. They won the battle. They weird to schedule ever. They won the battle for Atlantis, but they lost to St. Joe's, Drexel, and Penn in the non-league. That is insane. So they beat North Carolina, Memphis, and Texas Tech at Battle for Atlantis. They lose to Penn, Drexel, St. Joe's in the out-of-conference portion of the slate. It's unbelievable. And so I just bring it up because they have weird losses and weird wins, but they get the victory here in overtime against Creighton. Let me say this about Creighton. So I picked Creighton to go to the Final Four in the preseason. I really like their group. I'm not saying this because they lost to Villanova and I'm not disrespecting Villanova. I think I overvalued Creighton though, because you look at them, they have three returnees off of last year, Baylor Shireman, Trey Alexander, and Ryan Kalkbrenner. Those three combined for 44 points. The rest of the team combined for 22 points. And that's just not going to get it done in big East play. And I think that's the big thing. They have no depth. They have no real athleticism. They have no real defensive presence outside of Ryan Kalkbrenner. I think I'm out on Creighton. That was one of my final four picks too. Out on Creighton though, I don't believe in them. I just don't think they have the depth or the athleticism or the defensive prowess to win at the highest level. They're going to win some games in the Big East. I think they're a top 25 team, but I picked them to go to the final four and I think I was dead wrong. Another team that I picked to go to the final four, by the way, where Aaron was right, member... On Monday show, North Carolina lost to uh, Kentucky at the CBS Sports Classic. And I said, I think that is more of an indictment that Kentucky is really good than North Carolina is really bad. And I said, North Carolina, we're going to find out really quick because North Carolina plays Oklahoma on Wednesday night. Oklahoma's undefeated. Well, I bring it up because the two teams played and granted the game was in Charlotte. But North Carolina wins 81 to 69 as they get the win. Couple thoughts. One, listen, North Carolina is a really good team. You look at the ACC, I think they can win the ACC regular season. Virginia, we're going to talk about in a minute, got blown out. Duke bounced back nicely, but I'm not sold on them. You look at North Carolina, I think RJ Davis is your ACC player of the year right now. Um, I do worry a little bit about some of the other scoring around him. Armando Baycott has not been great this year. 14 points, eight rebounds against uh, against uh, against Oklahoma. But he's been kind of up and down. He did not play well against Kentucky at all. And this is a guy that, that, you know, two years ago, he was averaging 16 and 13. As a fifth-year guy, he's averaging 15 and 11. So his stats are actually down a little bit. Good thing for Carolina. I like the production across uh, uh, Harrison Ingram, 11 points in this game, 13 points for Cormac Ryan. So North Carolina gets the win. I like them. I think they might win the ACC. I'm not sold on everybody else. Do got to give credit where it's due, though. Duke takes care of business against Baylor at Madison Square Garden. I've been down on Duke. Don't love their guard play. Saw them in person at Arkansas a few weeks ago. Uh, But Duke gets the win. All five starters in double figures. But the important part, their star guard, Tyrese Proctor, has been out with an injury. Those other guards that I have criticized, They stepped up. Jared McCain, 21 points. True freshman, great game. Caleb Foster, 12 points. Great game. Jeremy Roach, who was really the only guy that showed up to play against Arkansas, 18 points in that game. Three rebounds, three assists. Duke gets the victory. Duke really needed this one. Listen, I'm still not out on Baylor. I know Baylor struggled. I know Baylor got embarrassed by Michigan State. Um, Excuse me, my voice is going here. I've been talking all freaking day recording multiple episodes for next week because that's what Torres does for the people. But, you know, listen, I was a little out on Duke. They get the win. Baylor, I'm not out on. I just think Baylor played two tough teams. 
Michigan State in Detroit, Duke, that's basically a de facto home game. They always play one game at Madison Square Garden around Christmas. So Duke gets the win. I still need to see more consistency from the guards, but they certainly have looked better. Duke, of course, opened ACC play a few weeks ago with a loss to Georgia Tech. They will now play Syracuse after the new year. They have one game on the 30th, so Duke is off for about 10 days now before really ramping up ACC play. Going back to Tuesday night really quick, let me give credit to a team, a a, a team that I have been critical of, but a team who I have also really liked since the start of the season. The Memphis Tigers are really good. So Memphis hosted Virginia on Tuesday night. Virginia came in at 9-1 and one ranked. Memphis destroyed Virginia, okay? And again, let me give myself a little credit because when they played in the battle for Atlantis, I said, this is the best team Penny Hardaway has had. It is an older team. It is a veteran team. Remember, Penny Hardaway, he came in. I'm going to be the one-and-done guy. We're, the, we're the, the, the NBA factory, James Wiseman, whatever. Then he realized coaching freshmen is really hard. You deal with, you know, especially the high-profile NBA guys. You deal with agents. You deal with this. You deal with that. So I just bring it up because the last couple of years, he has gone heavy on the portal, heavy on older players. He's got a really good team. David Jones, who's a transfer from St. John's, I'll be honest. You know I got that big Rick energy flowing through my veins. In on St. John's since Rick Patino took over. This kid, David Jones, I had no idea how good he was. He played at St. John's last year. He has since transferred to Memphis. He is phenomenal, and he was phenomenal in this game. 26 points against one of the best defensive teams in college basketball. 20 points per game he is averaging. Devon Quinterly, et cetera. Memphis is a top 15 team in the country. Now, the thing is, they have scheduled very aggressively in the out-of-conference because their conference stinks. But think about their resume right now. Here are their wins. Against Virginia, which came in at 10-1. and one. Clemson, which was undefeated when they played. At Texas A&M, which was ranked. At VCU. Beat Arkansas in the Battle for Atlantis. Beat Michigan in the Battle for Atlantis. Won at Missouri. So credit to Penny Hardaway, who gets the win in that one in what was the big result of Tuesday night. All right. I think that's it for this episode of the Aaron Torres pod. By the way, um, I uh, we got the Arizona-Alabama game going on. Credit where it's due. I didn't think Alabama, I thought Alabama was going to struggle in this game. Um, but I just bring it up solely to say, that uh, Alabama is up on Arizona right now. I'm going to get back. I'm going to watch this. I'm going to check it out for myself. Um, But I got to see for myself because I am kind of surprised. I thought Arizona would blow them out. It is now 23-21 with about seven minutes left in the first half. So I'm going to go watch this game. Guys, it's time for me to get out of here. Listen, if you're not subscribed to the Aaron Torres Sports Podcast, please make sure to do so. Apple. Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Music, wherever you listen to podcasts, make sure that you are subscribed. Also, make sure to rate and review the show. Go ahead, give us a quick five stars. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, all that good stuff. Make sure you're following on social media, at Aaron underscore Torres on Twitter, at Aaron Torres Pod on Instagram, Aaron Torres Pod on TikTok, uh, and the YouTube channel is blowing up. 31,000 subscribers on YouTube Uh, If you're not subscribed, if you're watching on YouTube, click the subscribe button on YouTube. But man, I'm getting out of here, man. It is late on a Wednesday. Bonus episode Friday. Jim Calhoun, the legend. He will join me. You will enjoy it. Even if you're not a UConn fan, I promise you. So make sure to subscribe to that. Make sure to download that. And then, oh, by the way, Tuesday after the holiday, we come back and we will make my college football playoff and bowl game picks. All for today's show. Time for me to go. Shout out to Torrent Craig. Shout out to Rachel, who hates my voice. Shout out to JJ Reddick, you F-head. Unblock me, bro. By the way, Pat McAfee, unblock me as well. Well, we're cool. I like your show. You're really good at what you do. I'll be back on tomorrow with the Hall of Famer, Jim Calhoun. Have a good Thursday party, people. Hope, Hope National Sign Day was good for you. Hope you're not a Florida fan.